th- first of all, thank you very much for coming back. I appreciate that. Um, I, I very much enjoyed our, our first chat and looking forward to chatting a little bit again. How, how are you doing besides growing an incredibly awesome beard? <laughs> reminiscent of my local legend, uh, Ernest Hemingway. Yeah, you know, I'm good. Things have been good. I noticed the David Bowie thing in the background. Are you a David Bowie fan? I mean, I am. I saw the doc. I'm actually renting this place, so this isn't my stuff. Oh, okay, so, fair enough. But, um, but yeah, so, but I am, as an artist, you know, I don't, you know, I, I thought the doc was incredible and captured what I, what I actually enjoy about him as an artist. So. Yeah, the the um, the uh, the last play that he did, Lazarus. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I don't know. If, did you get a chance to see that by any chance? It didn't have a big run. I didn't. I didn't see it. Yeah, yeah. The one in New York, um, the lead was played by Michael C. Hall, and um, who's a great uh, performer, an incredible singer, just a all around great artist. And it was a very very powerful uh, piece. I was there. I was lucky enough to see it on the opening night. Um, and when he did that play, he didn't really tell anybody that, you know, he was sick. Um, so oh. it, kind of, it kind of became yeah. this um, this kind of requiem, you know, mm. of, of sorts. Yeah, it was quite, quite, uh, quite dramatic. But in any case, man, I, um, I saw the finale, obviously saw the finale. I've seen it a few times of Game of Thrones and I was, you know, absolutely blown away and, and I think one of the things that I wanted to sort of chat about, because it was one of the most surprising sort of character twists or, or twist is a bad way to put it, but was the kind of emergence of the um, Eamon uh, character. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, because he he's Game of Thrones is very good at sort of making you pick sides a little bit or like, you know, like like even though it's easy to pick somebody from either side because both sides have virtue and both sides have flaws. Right. Um, you know, I was all in on, you know, Rhaenyra and her story and Damon and all that stuff. And like, I was rooting for that team. Right. Right. And then here comes this Eamon character who at first you're like, Oh, this, you know, this crazy kid, he stole the dragon and all this stuff. But then when he, when he's all grown up and sort of like, you know, blossoms, he becomes this incredible anti-hero. So, so right. it's like, what what was it like working with that actor and sort of getting that in- weird stoic evil out of him? I, I mean, the kid's an incredible actor. It's just like- I and mean, Ewan's amazing, and I think the, the 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 character that he channels is actually one of my favorite because I I, I feel like it's it, in a way there's the most relatability to people that have ever been bullied, and mm. you see him as an adult trying to reclaim his power. Right. So you, you know, behind, behind it, behind the stoicness is real insecurity. And am I good enough? And I have the biggest dragon in the world. Am I good enough? You know, this, this trauma, you know, and, and the, and the teasing and the, 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 the escalation of it, um, whatever he's putting out there is, is a front to, to something really, um, you know, powerfully sad behind it, you know? And, and so, uh, you know, my 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 heart breaks in some ways for him as a character because of that. You know, and I I, I can feel that's where everything's coming from, and that was what made him so interesting and so interesting to work with on those scenes. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to hear you say that because that last scene, and I wish that last scene would have gone on for three days because I could have you know lived in that moment for you know for a long time, but he really goes from this, you know, kid that's out for, you know, his revenge on the kind of the eye thing and the bully thing to a kid who's found his dad's, you know, gun doesn't really know how to wield it. And then it goes off by accident and it happens so quickly that you like, yeah, you know, it was just like a really amazing piece of character development. I thought it was very, very great. Great. That, that's. I mean, that's what that that was the idea behind it. I, you know, Viserys sets it up at the beginning of the season that it's an illusion that we can that men control dragons mm. and and to pay that off and to see it. But they, but that's actually a, one of the best analogies I've heard is, you know, a kid who finds his dad's gun and accidentally goes off. It's it's a it's a you know you you're playing with it. It's all it's all there. You're trying to intimidate with it, and then the unimaginable happens. And and you know that's not that that, that I don't believe was the intent. 
you know, how, I mean, it was interesting to hear people say, you know, well, that was not what happened in the books, but you know, again, you know, you're, you're dealing with a history book and, and a point of, and it was all seen in point of view. Now, how Eamon comes back from that remains to be seen, but the, in that moment, I think it was interesting that the dragons got away from both of them. Yeah, and uh, it's it's funny that you bring up the book because as somebody who's actually read the book, and I've actually read it a few times, um, because to your point, there isn't a ton. Uh, I mean, there is a ton there, but um, it's not like um, like the Game of Thrones books where you have to like boil it down to like get the story. Here, yeah. you kind of have the outline, and you got to sort of blow it up. And that's what Brian is think- so amazing. You're right. It's like there's there's you get to and you can choose who which narrator seems to be the most reliable of the events you know some of the i think it's i think the book or you know is told from three or four i mean those are particular chapters are you know three or four different points of view some years years later told sure and everybody you know you know mushroom inserts himself into the story um you know, he's always seems to be there as a way to kind of bolster his own relevance. So there's like, there's that aspect, you know, there's, there's the things that were sort of more widely witnessed like that confrontation at Storm's End. And then you can only, the only two people who know what happened on those dragons was you know, Eamon and Luke. So everybody else saw it from the ground. So yeah. it, it, it provides real opportunities for interpretation. I think Ryan did an incredible job with that. Yeah, for sure. And um, in the book, there's actually a very obviously stated kind of Rashomon effect that happens with that whole scene where there's a lot of people that believe um, that um, Rhaenyra's son is still alive um, and that he became a sailor and like, you know, because he didn't want to deal with all of the stuff. So like even in the realm, in the book, nobody really knows what happened, you know? So yeah, kind of- I mean, they allude to it, but. I mean, <laughs> definitely looked like I got eaten by a dragon, but who knows? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I, 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 I know they speculated on that, and I think that as you, as as the hist- as I mean, I remember that passage in the book, and I think there's some wishful thinking in that. You know that that somehow right. you know he survived that fall and 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 everything, but you know, it would be. Uh, uh astonishing yeah, bit, yeah, yeah but yeah, also yeah. what i but i love but i love that speculation it's like we didn't see a body so there and, and everybody has that it's like the um sure you know anastasia romanoff you know like you think that you know maybe they someone got away maybe maybe you know and that's great and that's that you know and and, and and should you know it was it was it was nice to um it was nice to see that that people holding out hope yeah and like i think um it just kind of goes to show. But of course, the, I don't want anybody to pull out that like he definitely got eaten by a dragon. Like, who knows? I'm 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 saying that like in that moment, that's what what was it appeared right. to be. But I love the idea of imagining in the same way that I love that you know Lenor, you know, shaved his head and and, and ran off and didn't die. You know, and right, that, right. That we went. So there's there's those twists on history that I think are terrific. Yeah. Right, right. And like, and spoiler like, warning, in the book, he gets murdered by his, you know, um, his buddy, right? Like, uh, right. you know, um, which which in the which in the show, um, Damon kind of pays his buddy off to fake murder him. But in the book, supposedly, and that's also a little bit kind of mysterious in the book. But like, like in any case, one of one of the things that's always frustrated me as a film student is um, when I was much younger, obviously now I'm, I'm way past it, but was with 2001, you know, everybody would tell me, Oh, but did you read the book? And, and like that particular example, I think is the one that you really used to irritate me the most because first of all, 2001 was a book based on a screenplay, right? Like the script predates the book and uh, you know, Arthur C. Clarke novelized the screenplay. So already there, it's like, whatever. But, you know, these are two very different mediums, you know? And, like, I think that the medium of filmmaking, of sight and sound, um, allows you to articulate a world that can be inspired by a literary work, but that is not beholden to it in any way, right? So, um, you know, for me, as somebody that had read the book and kind of knew what was going to happen, I was still extremely surprised 
by the way that it was articulated on the screen. And for that, I really got to thank you uh, for giving me such a, a okay. satisfying conclusion, you know, to that story, because even like the way, you know, people always, and I'm sure you've heard this a million times complain about, you know, game of Thrones or, you know, house of dragon shoots too dark. They shoot day for night and, you know, um, it gets dark and blurry a little bit, but, to me, that final rainstorm battle between those two dragons, the color palette, the lighting effect, the shadows, like the, you know, the fact that you couldn't see beyond the horizon, even when he lands at, at, um, at that castle or whatever it's called, was really impressive, man. Like really, really beautiful stuff. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, a lot of, I'd say that sequence began when I landed in London, it was like almost a year from beginning to end, like mm. not just planning it, putting it together, but you know, those big, huge sequences need the most amount of time. So they're the first things you want to get done. And there was a lot of room to design that, um, design that battle, you know? And of course, looking at, you know, we looked at Top Gun, we looked at uh, how to train your dragon. We were looking at sequences, um, you know, which is funny because you know, you wonder, you talk about something predating something, the book predates, you know, how to train your dragon, right? So, right, um, right. And Roger Deakins is such a great job on that. But, you know, you're going to look at everything. You're gonna, you know, there's people riding on dragons and you're just going to sort of see what what are the things that start to make that stuff look bogus. And, and you know, the the flashing of Vagar was something that um, was actually like the shot that I worked on really hard because it was getting the right amount of strobing and just to keep selling how massive Vagar is. Um, right. Cause she is a, you know, a big one. So right, right. that was, you know, there was opportunities like that that really got me excited and, and to kind of craft that. And there's versions that we've thrown out of it. We've shortened it. We've lengthened it. You know, it took, it took a lot of forms to get it to that spot, but I wanted to be just a step ahead of the audience as much as I could be. I think you know the second you see the storm, you know, and he's flying into the clouds that dread should overcome you. But hopefully there were still some surprises in there, which sounds like there were. So I'm glad. Yeah. Um, do, when, when you set out to craft an episode like that, do you have a budget of, of minutes on screen that you know you have to fit that final sequence into? And then you kind of reverse engineer back into that or... Is that like, do you have a little bit more flexibility? Because I know when you're making a feature, you can, you know, you pretty much have a, a little bit more wiggle room, right? In terms of runtime. Yeah. But with, with television, like, you know, even though there are varying, uh, you know, episode lengths in, in House of Dragon, um, did you have like a set amount of time that you had to squeeze everything into? I mean, they, no, I, I don't, I didn't feel constrained. I mean, there was... A lot of conversation around that because you want to know you know like is this going to be an hour with a minute and a half title sequence and a minute like you know two and a half minutes of it already taken out for credits um or is there room to go over and as you saw some episodes ran a few minutes over i think that you know the story wants to be it you know the story it wants to tell that said i think the restraint and the constraint of the hour really creates some efficiency however like that end shot the very last shot was actually even I think it was came in at a minute, but it was really like a two and a half minute scene. Like you saw Damon get the news, you traveled with Damon as you saw him kind of process and change and and then move up into the um, um, into the into the uh, the council chamber, you know, with the painted table. And so there was there was things like that. Like I would have sat in that shot because I felt like you're coming off of such like an intense right. sequence and you just need to like catch your breath and just sit and just be in the quiet of it. But, you know, respect the choice to, to tighten it up. You know, like I knew that that was a possibility and there's a few scenes that aren't in there um, for some structural reasons and some things that I think that were good to take out just to keep the spine on Renera and Damon. Um, yeah. But, you know, I hope they, you know, come out with some great DVD of the, you know, there's probably, I don't know. I don't know how long, how many minutes, maybe, I don't know. I can't speculate how much stuff <laughs> right. is on the didn't make it into the to the season exactly, but uh, there's stuff yeah. out there that's that's cool and that you know people I'm sure would find interesting. After the I play. saw some of the stuff. I don't know if you posted it yourself or or if it was posted and credited to you, but I did definitely see uh, the storyboards uh, about the alternative 
sort of uh, relationship shot between the dragon and Rhaenyra as she hears the final news, uh, which was the original intent for the final scene, correct? Well, that was, I, I it was not. It was, I, I brought the question to Miguel because it was, I think, originally in the pilot script that it was, that there was a cut to the dragon at the end after you go off in the close up. So mm. I, I wanted to mirror what Miguel was doing in the end of episode one at the end of episode 10. So if there was going to be a dragon at the end of that, I thought we should have one at the end of, at the end of 10. So the fact that it wasn't, I, I was, I was looking to see how to best mirror that, but we did yeah. put the cutaways to Cyrax in um, the birth scene, you know, which, which, you know, I think that was, one of the few opportunities to really, I mean, with Renera especially, I wanted to show that when things get agitated, that there is that dragon connection to their rider. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and see it on display in a few, a few areas. Yeah, that was, and I look, I, you know, I'm conscious of the fact that people listen to my podcast because mostly they like to create stuff and it's a lot of creators, whether it's like game designers or, or like young filmmakers or whatever. So I never really get into the politics of stuff too much, but I couldn't help to feel that this entire season had a pretty honest view about all the stuff that was, you know, that's happening right now, whether it's intentional or not. Um, I thought it brought up some really interesting, like, things you know and some things i won't get into because like why bother but you know i couldn't help to like you know this character of the dead child you know and, and how much it affected rhaenyra and how the stress of it created this you know faulty birth and all this stuff i mean without getting too into the meaning of it it was pretty powerful stuff you know and like definitely not for the faint of heart yeah. Um, and, and definitely like adults, you know, like, uh, you know, you have to have a certain maturity to be able to look at that and, you know, respect what emotions she's going through. You know, it was a it was a good episode, but I think you might get another Emmy for this one, Greg. Well, it was, it was pretty, right. pretty good. Pretty we'll good see. finale. Pretty good. Thank finale. You. I'd like I think you touched on something interesting, which is that it's it's adult. And that's you know, I, I was really. I was originally going to direct episode seven. Miguel and I switched mm -hmm. two and seven at the last minute because one and two are, are really of a piece. But I was really, I, I was glad I did two because two was a real sister episode to the finale. I think there's a lot of things said and done that I was able to mirror and be able to, especially with the Rainies and uh, Renera relationship. Sure. And, you know, while I think the first, you know, five episodes are in a way a coming of age of Renera. And, you know, I especially identify as a single dad, I especially identify with, you know, and I'm a single dad to a daughter. And I especially identified with his plight of Renera Ray's, uh, Ray's daughter and, 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 and a lot of those moments, especially in episode three. So I, I really, I, you know, when, when I, when I came, I was the, the first director to come on um, and, you know, I told Miguel I really wanted to do the finale. Like I, I, those adult themes, that partner on partner relationships, those things really activate for me. And mm. I just like the, the fact that it's actually really a very internal episode mm -hmm. uh, is also what a trend that it just, you know, opens up at the very, very end um, uh, is something that that kind of orchestration really does appeal to me as a director. Yeah, and like I think the the end result of blurring of of sort of muddying the waters of ethics and morality, and creating justifiable, um, violent uh, recourse, is very interesting because one of the big things that I saw in terms of sort of online feedback, and I'm sure you probably saw this too, was that whatever Rhaenyra does, I'm down with. Like she can pretty much do whatever she wants and I'm on Rhaenyra's side, right? This seemed to be a very like popular sentiment, you know, sure. like doesn't matter how much blood she spills, it's all justified. And, you know, that's a pretty powerful um, takeaway, right? Like, you know, that's not a, because, you know, we're supposed to be humans that respect all life and all that kind right. of stuff. Right. But, but when a piece of art uh, actually gets you to see, a horrific violence that you know 
can cause a lot of harm as a justifiable thing. There's a kind of a beauty to that as well, like in an interesting way. Um, so anyway, man, like, you know, uh, you're, I'm glad you're, you dug it. I'm glad, especially, I mean, I think the, I think the impact of that, the, it, it is interesting that that's the response that everything is justified from here. I mean, the, yeah. the, I mean, that's, and that, and then, you know, I think like everybody should, you know, soul search that a little bit. I mean, I yeah. think there's that, there is that if anybody hurt my kid, you know, you, 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 you as a parent right, really right. activate on that and then run those scenarios and understand those things that you hear, but it's like, to what, to what end it's almost like the 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 plan of action she had was you know really thought out and 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 now it's you know now it's so emo it's like she, she you can see in that in that last shot that she's not going to be able to see past those the impact right. and the emotion of that right sure. right and that to me is what makes it such a beautiful work because that the actual death the fulcrum that all of this justification is based on is actually missing all of the nuance of what actually happened right and what actually happened was that once again patty the baddie um is the true hero like it, to me he's the breakaway star of 2022 i mean it's just what a what an incredible Wasn't, force oh i mean his performance is yeah. phenomenal you can take that, no worries. No worries, no. It's uh just like I said, I'm keeping it on for the kids. So but yet, you know, that's my like brother calling. So the very thing that they're so passionate about is really the thing that they should be looking at as the thing to wage war against, right? It's kind of like you know, the analog is like, you know, maybe the best thing that this world can do is to de-arm everybody, right? Is to like minimize right. all of the nuclear warheads right like because like that is the real issue that is a bigger issue potentially than the humans that have the access to them um because you know humans can feel guilt and they could be like they can be made to see things where weapons of mass destruction just have one purpose which is to destroy right. um and um it's amazing that you can get these kind of themes without them a being shoved down your throat where it's just obvious, you know, like big oh, billboards that say it, and, right. and 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 be in a friggin' middle age like fantasy show, you know. So so anyway, man, like you're like a month and a half removed from this already. You're probably sick of it already, but I just wanted to give you your no, flowers. I, I, I thank you. I I I, I uh, I'll, I'll take I'll take your favors and uh, <laughs> for the journey. I no, I I you know I I I. I there there's in a way no it's one of the things i'm most proud of this episode so you know i i i on my instagram you probably saw you know the other things i've done that i feel you know this this holds with and i've i've done a lot in 30 years and there's you know five plus things that have been extraordinary for me just that hit all the you know the the process being on that side of the mountain in Monsanto and finishing that work with the coronation, you know, was sure. was phenomenal. You know, that was a once in a lifetime experience, and I felt a lot of gratitude that I was able to be present during all of that. And actually, it's why I took time off after the finale. I mean, after I wrapped the season, just to mm. I was actually just really wanted to see the show go out in the world. I didn't want to be doing something else and missing this cultural moment and impact that the show had on everybody. And it's, it's clear. I mean, Saturday night live, you saw that sketch that, you know, from the finale. Oh, you haven't seen it yet. Oh, no, dude, no, no. Like, you nailed it. It was so great. They did. They took a scene from the, the finale and, and you know, they did a great sketch. You got to check it out. Oh, really? So, Dave Chappelle, uh, th this last one that he just did, right? Yeah, he just did. Yeah, they do a yeah, great yeah. House of the Drag. And then Honest Trailers did a great send-up of it, too, which I you know, love Honest Trailers. I've been listening to them. So when that's I see cool. those things out there, that's great, you know, to to be in the cultural conversation. You know, I just posted a picture of Matt today on my Instagram that, you know, like everybody grabbed onto. It's like nobody's ready to let the show go right now. And I experienced that with House, too. You know, House was, mm -hmm. was the biggest show in the world at the time it was you know to be in the center of that is incredibly exciting and 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 you know it's it's a privilege to have been able to tell that last story i, re I really had wanted to tell the finale i think the the damon ranera scenes especially is what drew me to that episode yeah i um my biggest surprise of the whole show was how much i liked 
the younger cast and how kind of bitter I was about there being a cast change and then how much I ended up liking the new cast, you know, right. like that, that to me was like, taught me a little bit, something about preconceived notions, right. That, you know, a lesson that people, humans keep learning again and again and again, but I was like, Oh, there's no way that, you know, they're going to be able to replace these two incredible actors that did such a good job. And, you know, sure as hell, like the, the older versions are just as good, you know, and yeah. it was like, you really felt that, you know, connective tissue there. And like, that was, you know, like I've even heard George R. R. Martin field questions and he kind of preemptively says, Oh, I bet you didn't like the fact that we changed cast or whatever. So you can tell that it was on his mind as well, but I actually didn't mind it, you know, after okay. it was all said and done, you know, it was but a bold, it was, it was a bold move. I wonder, you know, if, everybody knew how much everybody would fall in love with the younger versions of the characters. Sure. If, if we would have gotten it through, but in a way it was a, you know, it, it was almost like coming into a new season at, at the start of six, which, which was also an incredible feat to be able to do that in the middle of the show. And I think great TV surprises and it's, it's hard to do that now and to, to do the job. I and mean, when we talked about that, it's like, we've done our jobs, right? Like everybody's going to love these two characters and they're going to mourn their loss. So, six had you know that's why again i think miguel took six like six had so much to do to like get everybody engaged and you start to realize this show is really about the kids yeah and you know and that's the connective tissue that's going to lead to war so you have to get to them you know you could have vamped a season of stuff i mean for me like i the one story that we skipped over in the time jump you know i would have loved to see lena claiming vagar like I would have watched a whole limited series of that story, you know, right? And, you know how that happened and the journey she went on, and and I would have, I, a hundred percent was down to see that. Yeah, because like I missed it in the first my 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 first viewing when I saw it live. That when she's walking with Viserys, um, that's what their conversation is about. You know, she's yeah. talking to him about Vagar, and. That, that didn't really register until I saw it again, you know, in, in my sort of second viewing. But yeah, that's all like, that's the only sort of antecedent that you get to her actually having yeah. Vagar is that little conversation. There was a deleted sequence um, out of episode two where you, after the announcement that he was going to wed Allison, you know, you had, you had their scene together. And then there was a scene that followed in the garden between them you know and just you you kind of really saw the lack of agency these two characters have in this world of men and you went from that and you saw this mirror scene to episode one of uh Rhaenyra dressing you know her future stepmom in her wedding dress that you don't ever see the wedding and then you kind of montage from that over to Lena on on a balcony and uh Rhaenys you know comes and joins her mostly because it's the only, it's the only time they ever shared a scene together. So we put Rainey's in that scene and there's just a moment of them on the balcony and in the distance you hear Vagar and she kind of looks up, hope the, the young Lena looks up hopeful and you, you know, plant that. So it was actually, it was, it was a great sequence to just to check in that, the, that, that none of these young women have agency of their lives right now. And, mm. you know, but again, when you see it in the totality of the season, um, you understand that those points have been hit, you know, um, so I do hope people do get to see some of the things that did come out because I think that they will give greater appreciation for the stuff you've already seen, but completely respect that they were taken out because the story was already being told and the point already made. But that's the, that's the, the push and pull you're always having. Uh, but that's the great thing about the hour format, you know, whereas sometimes when people don't have those restraints, things feel a little too indulged. So I always like, See, one of the things I love about television is restraint. Yeah, but like in an epic poem like this one, like it, it seems like it's okay, right? Because people are so bought in, you know, to like go on that journey um, that you can really kind of take some liberty with the with, with the length. In an ideal way, would you see that as like a director's cut, or would you just see it as deleted scenes? No, I think I think I I think deleted scenes. I think I think cuts. In television, I don't always think that the director's cut is the best version of something. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a director who loves 
feedback and notes and perspective. And, uh, you know, I don't, I, 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 I rarely think that I've seen something not get better as it goes through the process and the care and the attention. You know, often I'm producing as well, so I'm involved in those decisions, but I think they always just continue to improve as you get more time to refine them and tighten them and explore them and so forth. And a director in television only gets, a, you know, really just a few days to cut. So that's why you know, I became a producer as well. So I had more agency over my work and I could stay with my work longer than is traditionally uh, the case in television. It, as somebody who came into Game of Th uh, to House of Dragon with so much experience and you know your stuff in House and and Banshee and all of the stuff that you've done prior, the experience of House of Dragon were there any kind of new learnings that you had as a director that you know like you can clearly see the biggest difference of you when you started to you when you ended that something changed, a new lesson taken in or, or something like that? You know, I, I was really glad. Thank you for asking that. I mean, they're, they're on a technical level. I was working with virtual production, which is the first time I was working with that. And that was mm. so uh, the opportunities you have to work with something new, entirely new, are rare. So, you know, when, when film went to digital editing, you know, when the mm -hmm. Avid came around was the, was sure. the shift. When film cameras moved to digital was another ma major shift. And then mm -hmm. to introduce a virtual production stage was another incredible leap that was exciting. And I mean, I'm, I'm excited I've been able to witness such markers so on, on a technical mm -hmm. space. And then, you know, the, by nature of how things were scheduled, the finale was some of the last work I was doing on the show. And that was, there, there was, you know, you, I, I was able to, to look at, you know, at, 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 I, I kind of had a 30 year career mm. and to appreciate that my craft has improved over time and I'm able to wield those things and to get, to let all the, the, the sets and costuming and everything about the Game of Thrones world melt away and make a scene about, uh, you know, a, a man and a woman, a husband and a wife in peril and in those council scenes, you know, really was like such a high point, you know, and then watching the sunset over the, the mountain in Monsanto, you know, as you finished the you know, two day shooting of the coronation and the weather went your way and the sky was gorgeous and everybody delivered an incredible performance. I mean, those things that happen at every point, you know, we had two mentees, Marcus and Oz on, on, on the show. And, and I, I, I really, I know that they were doing it, but I, I told them how rare it is to see sets of this size, to see TV at this scale is going to be, you know, highly unusual. And it's an experience unlike anything else in television because it isn't like anything else in television. And, you know, what makes a great show is not that it just, it's not playing into genre and it's not playing into fantasy. It's playing into you know, it's, it's almost, it's a God, it's the Godfather in a way. It's, it's a story of a family tearing itself apart. Right. Mm. So, you know, those things are always at the foreground. It's like, what is the scene that's happening under the scene that's written? Mm. And I think that, you know, as someone who loves elevated genre so much, you see so often people just take the bait of the world building and not the character building. And the, the mud was where the characters were and that's the place to live. Yeah. And so, to go from that kind of high level to the to the sort of low level moment, that scene where Rhaenyra is having her miscarriage is one of the most powerful scenes I've seen all year, um, and a truly tough scene to watch. I mean, it, it doesn't feel like it goes beyond entertainment, right? Like like you're 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 watching a very tough tough moment, and from the fact that you're shooting her from the back like that she's even looking away from the camera. Like she doesn't even want to be seen like doing what she's doing. Like as a director, how do you approach that scene with an actor? I mean, like what kind of direction do you give an actor when you have, when you know that you have to go through some really, really tough shit? Like how do you go through that? I mean, the, the, there was a lot of focus on the birth, that birth in particular, because it was, it is so described in George's writing that um, that we there was a lot and it was one of those things that came really late in the schedule so it just it hung there as something that needed to get 
dealt with with me and Emma and Miguel and Ryan. Um, but you know, while we were doing the painted table scenes in Dragonstone, Emma and I would go to the apartment set, which was all connected, and start to just talk about it. Um, I let uh, them and their partner um, go in on the weekend just to mess around and, and you know play with the set so that everybody could have the space for their own process. I went in mm-hmm. and I kept thinking about, you know, I kept coming back to like what an animal does when it, when it wants to die, it like goes off into the woods. It doesn't want to be seen. And I think mm. there's that, there's that feeling that, that, you know, she, the character, not they, the actress was going off to die, you know, and that there's that, um, that aspect of, of, of kind of crawling and moving and, and getting to somewhere just to, to do it in private, that it's going wow. to kill them. And so uh, there, so that was partially why I was shooting it from, it was obstructed angles. Um, you know, it was, again, like a lot of other scenes, you want to modulate how much there's a tipping point where it becomes indulgent and becomes too much. And like you said, it's not entertainment and you mm. want to find it where it makes maximum impact and, and disturbs, you know, our, good art should disturb sometimes. And I think that the fact that it's uncomfortable and sitting in that discomfort and those things are, 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 you know, what you want people to be feeling. You don't want to feel like you, you, you shied away from something. And again, you're following the text of the book, you know, and these things have um, interconnectivity. Every birth connects to, to something else. That one in particular, what her, what her mom went through and, you know, the, 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 you know, and again, it's, it's a constant negotiation of like when you, and you want to, and you need outside perspective. This is why, like, again, I'm not, a big proponent for director's cuts. I don't, you know, sometimes they're good because you, you've, um, but often, you know, to your point, yes, people will come sit in things, but like, I love aliens. I love the theatrical cut of aliens because it got me to right. see it. I love the longer version because I get of more course. aliens of the thing I already love, but right. actually you a hundred percent get why you start the way you start that movie. Right. Right. So right. I, I really feel like, you know, you people, we went through this on house, you know, people, um, fans especially had really strong opinions about what needed to be happening and what was going on and what we were, whose life we were ruining by not doing the things that the fans wanted. And ultimately the fans love the show that, that you're putting out there. And mm-hmm. that's the, and if you've done that right, then that restraint to be able to continue to give them the thing that they want, but to make those informed restrained choices. I, I've seen a lot of things that, chase like you know when we were doing banshee for example people love the character job and tropper and i really made an, an effort to make sure that we'd never had job in the show more than we had job in the show at the beginning because mm. you know what ends up happening is you know you give people too much chocolate ice cream and they're gonna get stomach ache right so you right. want to dole these things out and um so i don't so again so as uh, there isn't like a longer version of the birth that I wish was out there. Like what's there. Had oh, no, we got enough. We got enough. Everybody that. got enough. I totally <laughs> agree. And I think that just like the dragon chase, like you didn't want to stay, you just want to, the expression to leave them wanting more is always right. Yeah. You don't want everybody to be like, dude, I could have done with like a minute less of that birth, but you know, I, you know, <laughs> but I think we, I think we struck a balance and it's the balance in the, in the big picture of the entire episode. And then, and then being one tenth of the bigger season. Oh man, I thought it was a spectacular um, episode. There's not, and I'm look, I'm a very arrogant self critic. I tried to think, you know, because I got, you know, all this academic knowledge. I'm like, oh, the, you know, there's a way to do this and that and like, you know, whatever. But man, I thought it was extremely well executed uh, at you. all at all levels. Even I thought that. One of my sort of most underrated scenes and, you know, obviously it's, it's kind of easy because I think Damon is kind of that, that, you know, that chocolate ice cream in, in house of dragon. Yeah. There was that, there's that one moment Well, there's two incredibly powerful moments, but the one that I particularly liked the most is when he's rattling off the names of the dragons that they already have control over. Right. And how, you know, your sons have paraxes and blah, blah, blah. And he's just, he's going through this entire list, this almost this roll call 
of his strength versus the strength of the other folks, almost trying to convince himself yeah. that this is a, an easy battle to win. And to me, there was so much layered nuance in that delivery. And again, you chose because like when I was watching it, I remember our last conversation of the, you know, you're not allowed to cut the head. And, but that again was a very similar shot to when yeah. you see him get angry. You know what I mean? So anyway, I thought that was an incredibly oh, powerful good. scene. Matt, Matt had a lot of pushback on that scene because he was like, oh, really? He's, if he's like, I feel like I'm, I'm, he said this in an interview, but he said he felt like he was just listing the Santa's reindeer. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh, you know, but it, it, it was important. It was important. And it was, it was, you know, look, I mean, I think that we should have those discussions and, you know, Ryan and, and Matt talked a lot about that, but that's, and you know, exactly the impact of what you're feeling is exactly why he's doing that roll call and why he's right. listing out exactly who everybody is and who's, which dragons are unclaimed and that connects to Bela. And then there's, you know, all there, there's, it's, it's, I mean, I, I loved it. I just, it was fun to sit there and like watch the, if you could watch the outtakes of that, because trying to get those <laughs> names right was crazy. Like right, that was, right. you know, and, and it's, uh, there, there really should be a good, I wish there was a, uh, a gag reel or something, you know, like we were so in it, there wasn't, and with COVID we could never wrap parties. So there wasn't like oh, man. a thing, although, um, yeah, that there's there's some great stuff out there that 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 uh, you know of, of, of the the outtakes, but that was I, I pre, I'm glad that scene landed, and I you know Matt did it, it, it as he always does does quite incredible. He's a very intuitive actor and in the moment actor. He's not someone mm -hmm. who likes to rehearse a lot, not for any other reason than he just doesn't want to find it and then recreate magic. He wants to find magic on screen, right where it's going to live, and and you want to find just the right balance of, you know, we got like half a day to kind of iron out the physical blocking of a lot of those scenes at the painted table because there was so much work and they were, they're fussy scenes to figure out mm. and you don't want to lose the day of shooting on some of the technical things. So we just very dryly, not even, we never really even performed them. We just wanted to work out like, where do we want to be and go and then leave room for the fact that once you put those wigs in costume and that place is lit, it's a whole other world and you have to be ready for the magic to, to happen and chase it. Yeah. And, and going back to the craftsmanship of being a director um, and that, that sort of very fluid um, adaptive art form of knowing how to get the best performance out of your actor how do you balance when you and your gut know that you're going to get that even though you have a preconceived notion of rehearsing X times, but you know, your actor likes to do X minus five. How do you balance that? Like, how do you know, like, you know, it's almost like my coach used to tell me that, you know, there's two types of players, Mark, in in pitching, you know, like, like uh, there's the pitcher that you have to yell at and there's the pitcher that you have to tell everything is going. Okay you're the type of pitcher that I have to yell at, you know, right. because okay. I used to pitch in high school, whatever. I wasn't very good, but I was, you know, I was a pitcher, but, I, but I never forgot that lesson, which is when you're trying to instruct somebody, it's not a black or white, that there is a, a kind of a, a dialogue of how to get the best out of somebody because it's not the same formula for everybody. How do you, it, how do you balance that with actors? I mean, that it's a, actually a great question i don't think anybody's asked that of me before and, and it's something i think about constantly and it's the it's at the foreground of every single day of shooting it's an ecosystem right so even an actor's process even if you understand it it still changes on the other environment but patty especially you know patty's pretty open about some of his special needs and the things that he goes through and when you can see those being activated um you have to protect the space and make this you know, it, it's like you know too much stimulation is gonna and if you're gonna start and that's gonna change the process which is gonna change the scene which is gonna start to snowball away so hmm. it's not it's being aware of an actor's process what they need then being able to create the safe space to do that then it's balancing it against everybody else's process right so some people love to rehearse till the day is long. Some people don't want to rehearse at all. So what do you do in this situation? So yeah. I try to service both things with the birth. 
you know, I could see that Emma, there was so much like, had we just done the birth on the first day, it would have mm -hmm. taken a lot of the steam out of the pressure of doing the birth. Like so many conversations were around it, what the baby looked like, why did it look that way? What was going on? Mm -hmm. There was, there was a lot of things to just a lot of gears and mechanisms that needed to work. Like Emma works that way. Whereas Matt, you know, is in, he is going to do something different almost every take and to be ready for it. Mm -hmm. And you can, at the same time, you can throw him anything and he's going to run with it. And you, you're really like, it's, it is, especially in those giant scenes, which is why I want to work out where everybody kind of physically wants to go is so that I can spend the time on the process that each actor needs. And, and, you know, you're putting it all together to make it work, but really once you're in with that particular actor in their close up or whatever their coverage is going to be is really the time to do that individual work that they need. So you get kind of, everybody has to come together as actors do. And that is one of my favorite things to watch is I think that, you know, my process is I give enough input. I kind of bump the sides. I, I like to mm. give, you know, a wide road to discover and then, um, see the actors themselves figure it out. What What is, you know, versus you go here, you go here, you stand here, you stand here, you turn here, you do this. I don't think works. I feel like I have a more you go, I'll follow mentality. I want to see what their instincts are and what they're bringing to it. Um, and then other times, you know, things are going to be highly technical. You know, there was, right. there's, you know, there's scenes, you know, I also, did, I also did the old man, if you saw that and that, there's a you know a sequence in episode three that required a great deal of choreography and performance and timing and so forth. So I feel like it's reciprocity. I I I, I want to give as much to the actor so that when I need something technical, like here we are, this is the shot, this is the thing that we're doing, that they'll respond and be there. You know, I don't want to sit there and micromanage how they hold everything and where they go and all their behavior, I think, is crazy. I know directors, there are some directors that do that. Uh, I'm not one of those directors. And I, I, you know, I talked to Paul Bettany, Bettany wrote me a sweet note after the finale. And, mm. you know, we, we had a conversation on Unabomber that, you know, uh, sometimes there's this backhanded compliment people give directors that they're great shooters. Oh, because you did that one too, right? I did Unabomber, yeah. Oh, yeah man, I, did I, the, I, I did the whole I, season of that. Man, did you direct every episode of that? I did, yes. So first of all, let me tell you a complete, because um, I just got chills. Um, when that came out, I got some horrible virus, right? This was pre-COVID. So it might have been COVID for all I know. Who the hell yeah. knows? But You I started sick. COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got sick as hell. And that was my sick show, was that Unabomber show. And I'm a, like, when I was young, I thought that I wanted to study linguistics, you know, like, like okay. to me, that was like, I was fascinated by that. You know, like I eventually didn't do that because like which 14 year old talks to their parents about studying linguistics. Right. But but um, man, that show was actually extremely good. Very underrated um, show, man. That, Thank that you. was a, a very, very good work. Um, the kid who uh, from Avatar, I got a I Kimberly. I forget his name right now. Oh, Sam Worthington. Sam Worthington was excellent in the show. And uh, and Paul Bettany, when he shows up um, towards, you know, like the like the last third of uh you know the season where you really get to focus on him in his like day-to-day -day life he does an excellent that show is really really good i'm surprised they haven't done a follow-up you know they kind did of they did a, a second season of manhunt they did it about the um the olympic bomber um mm. I, don't, I don't know where it lives i wasn't part of it um but the but andrew wrote it and i do want to check it out at some point but it's a different it's similar but different team making it but unabomber i you know i i was my first jobs uh were doing reenactments for america's most wanted mm. and i was going to dc during the time of the unabomber and like menendez trial was happening oj was happening the unabomber was out there it was crazy and i remember it from a certain perspective from what i lived and then to really learn the real story of what took place and to understand ted at a level that the media and most people didn't because I, you know, I got to access things in his file that the public's sure. ever seen, you know, is his unpublished autobiography, you know, and things like that, that he wrote. Yeah. He was, you know, that he was really of two people, you know, he was both Ted and he was the Unabomber. He was all of, he was all I, of one and one of the other. 
I got to ask you this, and I know we're running short on time here, and you've been so generous with me. I appreciate it. You know, AI booking bots aside, I really appreciate your generosity. <laughs> the booking bot. I love when I get it, I'm like, wait, who is this? And I try to write back and reason with the AI bots. And it's like, it, 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 like, it bots me back. Yeah, like, yeah. Wow, Elon, Elon programmed it. But um, are you a fan of Sidney LeMay? Because yes. I get I get very strong Cindy LeMay vibes from that show, both in that spectacular scene where they're waiting for the guy to like buy the newspaper, um, or you know, which I thought yeah. was you know very reminiscent of that kind of mid eighties like you know political drama. Like oh no, you know, you're like, right, you're right. I took it. I it's it's somebody did a shot for shot because it was heavily influenced by the conversation. Okay. Um, and you know, there was two things. There was two sequences that people picked up. And one, I mean, I like, I get a kick out of seeing the memes of Shrek compared to Game of Thrones, or people that have <laughs> right, grabbed, right. you know, some of the How to Train Your Dragon shots that are similar but not similar. And sure, we yeah, yeah. we did, you know, but I but I I was when we were doing the cabin scene from episode eight, um, being which was actually like. Jim, when I was when I met Jim Fitzgerald, the real Jim Fitzgerald, and he was like, "Oh, you know," and then they, they, you know, sawed the cabin off the base and helicoptered it to the court. And I was like, "Wait, what?" I'm like, "That that's opening the eighth episode, the final, right, the final right. episode." And so I didn't have a good like reference, so I just sent around the opening of Up with the balloons in the house, right, right, like, right, floating through. So there's there's definitely like homages to that and and that sequence, you know, where they're where they're all waiting. Uh, for for him to buy the uh, Washington Post um, uh, is or the New York Times, I think it was New York Times. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, in in the square um, was also like sort of designed around the opening of the conversation was an influence of that. And yeah, and, yeah, man. Actually, I learned that from Scorsese. Like Scorsese has a real kind of um, uh, you know cinematic diet that he that he that he puts together and he watches with his directors of photographies and some of his actors and 1000 percent it's you know and Pepe and I are, are no different language. and it's 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 a great tool to use to articulate what you're trying to do i mean we we, we do these decks and i hope people get to see them one day of you know that we that that pepe and i made for episodes two three and ten of visual references and lighting ideas and tonal things and framing concepts and you know that they're they're from 20 different movies but but they're going to be things that allow us to communicate to the other departments what we're doing and then that starts to inspire other ideas you know I, you know claire our uh, set decorator is really credited at the painted table and once i heard that that was going to light up i fangirled that like oh, so, so hard good. like i you can yeah, see yeah. how much i love the show in how we shot the table and to be able to do that it was like it was like somebody you know turning on an x-wing or getting something like that oh, you know from, sure. from being a kid so I, I i really did um you know i enjoyed making the show because i was a fan of the show and you know i do go in you know not judging my characters and, and loving kind of the experience and want to make something that I want to stay home on a Sunday night or a Friday night with Banshee, you know, or a Sunday night with, with, with house of the dragon to, you know, that that's going to entertain me, you know? Yeah. And, and speaking of that, you know, just to wrap up here, what, what kind of things are you looking forward to exploring um, in the kind of next chapter? You know, I, I have, you know, I continue. I actually just spoke at Unreal Fest you know, regarding a lot of the virtual production, but I've been fascinated by, you know, I've been approached a few times for producing stuff in the metaverse, and I'm curious what that means. I watch the way my kids interact <laughs> with Roblox. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, about experiential storytelling and what mm. that could mean. I'm interested in where things are going. I'm interested in the merger of, you know, especially during virtual production the merger of technology and storytelling, mm. um, especially a lot of the tools that we worked with on House of the Dragon, a lot, like gave me freedoms that would have been harder to realize. And it was, you know, like to do that dragon fight, for example, we were able to create the blocking, right? So we were able to create the dragons, what they were going to do. And then, you know, what I kept saying is I want to be on, 
a camera dragon and flying with them and getting these shots. So I, I only want to be where the camera could get to. I don't want to do anything too trick, which which also Roger Deakins, who visual consulted on Wally, How to Train Your Dragon, um, in general, you know, wants to ground the camera and make sure it feels real. It doesn't That's feel like- That's a very like... interesting point. That's a very so, interesting yeah. point because now that I you did, say that- yeah, I was yeah. just gonna say we and then there's an additive thing where I was just playing with my toys. I had these two toy dragons that I used and we shot it on yeah. my, my iPhone um to kind of put that sequence oh, wow. together. And then just, your mix just... we had a version that was like storyboards, stuff on my iPhone, some some previs, and then we would also like shoot with a virtual camera the dragon chase, and then we would have like dailies from that that we would start to cut together. So it would this sequence was made from a lot of different pieces. Um, and that was just me finding and playing with all the different tools that were available to see what the best tool for the job was. Mm. And in, in the end, 90% of it was playing with my toys. Do you, do you have a VR headset? I do. Yes. Um, the quest Two. I do. Yeah. So um, maybe offline, I can shoot you um, uh, a code to download my application um, because that's like basically after I sold Collider, um, that's been my primary focus is just building a VR development studio. Um, and when, when I lived in LA, I actually on Orange Street, I think that would, that that's the street it was called. I built a virtual production stage. Um, so I'm actually extremely familiar with, you know, all the LED unreal technology, that entire pipeline. And I've brought a lot of that over into VR because that's the beautiful thing about unreal is that it's actually the same exact technology, right? Yeah. But now instead of it being on these gigantic LED screens, it's inside of these two tiny LED screens. Right. Um, but I've also been doing a lot of experimentation with a technology called GPT-3, uh, soon to become GPT-3-4. I'm sorry, okay. GPT-4, which is an AI technology actually created by a company called OpenAI, which is, uh, you know, funny enough... Uh, <laughs> um, you know, also Elon Musk funded, but the, the entire premise of this technology is to create artificial uh, characters, right? Right. So in my current application, um, you can have full on dialogues uh, with artificial intelligence. And it's and it's way more natural than talking to like an AT&T, like AI, you know, booking like, bot. Right, right, booking bot. Um, and on top of that, I, I um, I've been working with a with a, a few technologies to synthesize voices. Um, so in the demos that I have, I had a couple of my actor friends do like a George Lucas voice and an Arnold Schwarzenegger voice, and you would be surprised how mind blowing it is to actually have dialogue with these things. So anyway, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that kind of potential storytelling medium inside the headset. I'd be happy to walk you through some of that stuff. Yeah, for um, sure. You know, because for sure. it's... No, I'm, fasc I'm fascinated. So like, you know, I mean, th that these things in the next chapter, you know, I feel like, you know, I want everywhere I go, everything I do to creatively hit for me and be something that, that that's cool, you know, is, is, is pushing that. I've been, you know, I've, I've, I've exceeded my wildest dreams when I imagined mm -hmm. doing all this. And, and so I'm at that spot where I want to be able to, you know, tell stories and to build worlds and, and how I do that and where I do that, um, you know, is part of the adventure. Yeah. Well, look, um, thank you so much, Greg. Hopefully you didn't have any money in FTX and, uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I, uh, you know, really, really thank you for coming back again. Uh, however means it got you here. I appreciate it. I really, no, I love it. I love talking to you. It's, it's, it's one of the more thoughtful, deeper dives that I get to do about the work. And, uh, it was great last time. That's why I told you I'd come back after the finale and I wanted to come back and was excited to get the note. So. Cool. So thank you guys. This is Greg Yaitanis, who I, I'm telling you right now, and look, I'll be totally uh, transparent here. Patty will win the Emmy. There's no question about that. And I th I'm not a hundred percent sure that you're going to take it. Cause I haven't seen a lot of the other stuff, but you're either taking it for old man or for, or for house of dragon. But I think you might be nominated twice, you know, oh, okay. um, you know, okay. like in the same category, like, God, I forget who else got nominated twice one year. Uh, famously, I think in the Oscars, they got nominated twice. Um, but anyway, incredible work. 
and I truly appreciate it as a fan. So thank you very That's much. Right. I appreciate it. All right. Okay, bye bye, y'all. Take care.